Well over a decade later, the Nintendo DS is still one of the most successful handheld consoles ever. Including every iteration and model of the DS family, it is actually the second best selling video game system, right behind the PlayStation 2, with well over 150 million sales. As a result, the Nintendo DS has a massive library of games including some of the most sold games of all time. But I ask you one thing, dear viewer. How many racing games do you remember on the DS? Sure, the first obvious answer that I'm sure comes to everyone's mind is Mario Kart DS. After all, it is the third most sold DS game with over 23 million copies sold. But let's zoom out on that list of best-selling DS games for a moment. Take a closer look at the genre column. Platform, puzzle, role-playing, action-adventure. All of these seem to dominate the charts of DS games. But not a single other racing game can be found other than Diddy Kong Racing DS, which is yet another kart racer. Let's quickly compare this to the list of best-selling PlayStation 2 games, where searching for the term racing nets us a whopping 18 results. But that's not a handheld, of course, so let's try the DS's direct competitor, the PSP. The Wikipedia list is considerably short with just 22 games listed, but even out of this short selection, four of these are racing games. So surely it's not a handheld thing, but maybe it has something to do with the hardware. So let's check out the PlayStation 1, which had somewhat comparable looking and playing games. Sadly for this list, the genre isn't listed, but I counted a total of 18 racing games on it. So if it isn't the era, if it isn't the type of system, and it isn't the hardware, what's the issue? Why did the Nintendo DS receive so few racing games that people remember? This is exactly the question I would like to find an answer to, and what better way to do that than taking a look at a handful of racing games that did come out during the system's lifespan. For now I've selected 15 racing games and I will be analyzing each one of them, going into detail about how they work, how they play, and whether or not I would have recommended them to anybody. Many of these games are ports from versions on much more powerful systems, so while I will draw comparisons to the main version of these games, I will try to rate them on their own merit and mostly compare their quality to other DS racing games. And so with that, it's time to dust off that old DS and play some racing games. This was probably a horrible idea. The game I want to begin with is Need for Speed Underground 2, because it is one of the first games that got released out of my selection and has a mainline counterpart that is fairly well known, so we kind of know what to expect going into this. Need for Speed Underground 2 is one of the most popular and beloved games released during the PlayStation 2 era, mainly due to its great customization, atmosphere and early attempt at an open world. While it certainly isn't without its share of flaws, it manages to hold up decently well even today and remains one of the best games in the series to date. So how does the DS version compare, running on considerably worse hardware? Trust me for now, it's better than it looks. This is where I have to put a disclaimer that I played all of these games on an emulator with increased internal resolution, so these games will look a lot sharper and cleaner than they usually would have. They also run better for the most part, so my experience with these games may have been better than if I had played them on an original console. I just thought it would get tiresome looking at an image like this for so long, so for the sake of watchability I decided to make use of the emulator's full capabilities. So with all that technical stuff out of the way, how is Need for Speed Underground 2 on the Nintendo DS? Well for one, I was pleasantly surprised that they managed to translate most of the main mechanics onto the system. Let's take the customization as an example. I full well expected to choose between a selection of presets for each of my cars, but I am actually able to choose bumpers, spoilers, rims, vinyls, and much more separately to make my car truly unique. Sure, it's not as extensive as the original game which lets you put speakers in the trunk, but it still manages to offer the same amount of customization, if not more than the direct follow-up Need for Speed Most Wanted. A pleasant surprise was the fact that I could make use of the system's touchscreen to draw my own vinyl and apply it to my car, which is a feature exclusive to this version of the game. I just wish the car models themselves would look a little better. I mean, look at this RX-8 right here. That's just insulting. So in terms of customization, I am more than satisfied. But what about the actual racing portion of the game? Unsurprisingly, the DS version does not have an open world, but a selection of courses you will drive on during your campaign. Many of these tracks actually seem to be downscaled versions of the PSP version or inspired by other tracks from older Need for Speed games. But in general, they look alright, 
some portions of the tracks were a bit awkward to navigate, but all in all I had little problems with how the game looks or plays. The handling of the cars took some getting used to, and this is a challenge that racing games will face on the system, because the steering inputs are digital. As you know, the Nintendo DS only had a D-pad instead of analog sticks or a circle pad, which has a direct input on the way cars handle in these games, as you can either full steer or not at all. In Underground 2 DS, it works in a way where the car starts to steer more the longer you hold down a direction on the D-pad. This felt very awkward at first, and in the footage you will see me oversteer quite a bit, but after some getting used to, I managed to drive mostly cleanly through the courses. In general, the racing felt pretty good, with a decent sense of speed and enough control over the car. Traffic is a thing, and it's hard to evade it sometimes, and when you do crash, it is pretty devastating, especially since the AI is pretty ruthless in terms of difficulty. In total, there are three different event types, although only drag racing feels distinct enough to warrant a separate mode, with the other ones just being different forms of regular circuit racing. Occasionally you get the chance to complete certain minigames in order to unlock extra upgrades for your car, which quite frankly play terribly and are super lame, so I skipped most of them. In general, I wasn't too excited about the whole progression aspect, as you basically fill up bars by completing races in a pretty linear fashion. But all in all, for a DS game, it is quite enjoyable and a pretty solid start. To make these reviews legitimate, I will be ranking each game on a scale of 1 to 10, because as everyone knows, you can't be a reviewer without attaching an arbitrary number to a game. And in the case of Underground 2, I will be giving this one a solid 7. So Underground 2, honestly, not bad. Really good first effort. I didn't expect these games to actually function as well as they do. I really expected some really low quality stuff in this, but honestly, aside from the car models, not bad. The next game I checked out was Asphalt Urban GT. You may recognize the Asphalt name as they have evolved, or devolved depending on who you ask, into a series of free-to-play mobile games. Asphalt Urban GT doesn't just mark the very first game in the series, but was also part of the launch lineup for the Nintendo DS, and makes it the very first DS racing game ever made. And... It kind of shows. I think the gameplay speaks for itself. The movement and momentum of the vehicles doesn't just look strange, but feels strange as well. The handling is not uncontrollable, mind you. In fact, I had few issues controlling my cars. But there is a pretty unnatural understeer to each car. Especially the SUVs would hardly even move at all, which was particularly frustrating on technical sections of the tracks, of which there are a small handful of. I do give credit with the creativity of the tracks here, they really went all out on these. Apart from your regular city tracks from all around the world, there are completely wacky ones like Chernobyl featuring a bunch of military vehicles on the road, or one called USA Speedway which uses NASCAR as traffic. How cool is that? Not only are the tracks pretty creative, but they also look pretty good for a DS launch title. Same goes for the car models, which look much better than the ones found in Underground 2. At least, as long as you don't apply any body kits to your cars, because they make it really obvious that the models are simply mirrored, which can lead to completely broken decals and text on the liveries. Speaking about customization, it is certainly not as detailed as Underground 2, as you can mostly just select from a handful of presets, but they look admittedly pretty cool and are inspired from actual race cars. You can just tell that the developers were actually passionate about racing as a whole, as most of the track layouts are also inspired by real life racetracks. Sadly, that's about all there is to the game. The career mode is fairly simplistic, you're basically just moving from one tournament to the next, with not a whole lot of different event types and game modes to shake things up. You earn money which you can invest into new cars and upgrades, which are actually pretty detailed by showing you the actual specs of the car and how they change with each upgrade. If you're looking for more variety, the arcade mode has a few extra game modes like one where you can play as a cop and need to arrest a certain number of races before the timer runs out. I wish these extra modes would have been included into the main career to make it more interesting. But that's about all there is to say about Asphalt Urban GT. It's obviously a fairly flawed game with a lot of noticeable passion poured into it. Looking how the franchise has changed over the years and where it is now, being the most successful racing game on mobile devices and pouring in millions and millions of dollars, it is quite bizarre looking back at this humble little game. The first Asphalt may not be a great or even good game, but it has a lot of heart. And for that I will give it a 5. 
So far, so good. Obviously, I didn't expect any of these DS games to be on par with proper console titles at the time. But for a quick round or two while you are in the waiting room or in the train, both these games seem to be decent time wasters. But let's jump back to the Need for Speed franchise, because the next entry in the series would become the most sold, most beloved, and dare I say, most wanted entry in the franchise. I am of course talking about Need for Speed Most Wanted. To this day, it is often regarded as the peak of the franchise thanks to its amazing pursuit system, gritty atmosphere, fun cutscenes and story, and of course amazing handling model. The customization took a little backseat in this one compared to its predecessor, however all in all Most Wanted still delivers one of the most enjoyable arcade racing experiences to date. Now, how does the handheld version of this monumental title play? If footage could speak for itself, it would be able to say enough in just 5 seconds. But this is a YouTube essay, so naturally it is my obligation to dissect this wreck of a game into little pieces to maximize the time you spend watching this very video. Let's get the obvious things out of the way. The graphics are dreadful. The car models look like a child's vague recreation of what they are supposed to represent. The sounds are a complete disaster with the engine sounding like someone is busy mowing the lawn next door. On a purely audio-visual level, this has to be one of the poorest racing games I have ever seen and is on a comparable standard to Big Rigs. At least, unlike Big Rigs, the game has music. However, I am not sure how good of a thing that is when the music sounds like this. Now thankfully, games are more than that, so perhaps the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay has something to offer. Well, it is with a heavy heart that I must say, even in that department, the game disappoints. The car handling is awful. I never had a good understanding of how long I need to press the D-pad for the car to turn in, so you will often see me oversteer hard into a corner. Every car practically sticks to the ground with no believable physics model in place. Ramming opponents or traffic has no effect other than putting your car into an immediate standstill. The general racing aspect is a complete mess and no matter which aspect or detail I can think of, there is usually not a single good thing coming to mind that I could share. But what about the story, since that has been one of Most Wanted's most beloved aspects? Nope, not even that one has been translated well into this port as you basically just get dumped into the game with a list of racers to beat that have no correlation to you or anyone else. That being said, they were a bit ahead of their time here. In fact, the Blacklist races are oftentimes completely different compared to their council counterpart, and the ones that did remain have entirely different cars, different liveries, or both. The only Blacklist racer that stayed mostly the same is Razor, and even that would be overselling it as he is not even using the right M3 model. All in all, I get the impression that this game was slapped together in mere months, if not weeks before the release date by an understaffed and likely underpaid team of semi-skilled developers with very limited access to concept art and scripts. The result is one of the worst experiences I have ever had in my over 18 years of playing racing games and an absolute disrespect to one of the best racing games ever created. Due to its utter lack of redeeming qualities, I think the only fair rating for Most Wanted on the DS would be a 1 out of 10. The only way this game could have been better was if it wasn't working at all. Oh man... Why out of all games did it have to be Most Wanted? Like, it's also one of my favorite Need for Speed games. And they really just... They crapped on the legacy so hard. I just hope it doesn't get worse than this. With the sheer disappointment that was the DS version of Most Wanted, I was curious to see if the Asphalt franchise has followed a similar trend with its sequel worsening in quality, but that is where I decided to head next. And thankfully, I didn't have to wait long for a pleasant surprise as the start menu greeted me with this song. To my knowledge, this is the very first time a licensed song would be used in a DS game as opposed to music composed for the game. And I can already spoil that it won't be the only one. Yes, the song is heavily compressed and probably sounds even worse through the original DS speakers, but I would much rather have this than whatever music genre Most Wanted was going for. And I hope you enjoy this song, 
Because this is the only song that will ever play in the menu. And it will start over and over and over again from the exact starting point no less. Personally, I thankfully like the song, so I never really had an issue with it. But let's stop talking about the music and finally get into the actual meat of the game. In short, Asphalt 2 does not follow into Most Wanted's footsteps and is instead a definitive step up over the first game. It includes pretty much all the content from the previous entry, polishes up the main mechanics and presents everything in a much more interesting way. For once, the career gives you a lot more options for what to do next, so you are hardly ever forced into driving cars you don't enjoy. Each car has more customization available, which can sometimes offer some truly cool stuff, like this Camaro that I turned into a convertible, or this Skyline that you can turn into Brian's Skyline from the Too Fast Too Furious movie. The creative and unique body kits were one of my main motivations to keep playing, as I always wanted to know what crazy things I could turn my cars into next. In terms of vehicles, bikes are a new addition to the game, and while I am usually not a bike guy, it is pretty sick that the bikes in the game have a selectable first person view you can use. But what about the racing? Although it may look pretty similar at first, believe me when I say you have a lot more control over your vehicles. This is especially noticeable in the returning SUVs, which now feel a lot more snappier to control and throw around corners. Handling wise, it is a pretty standard brake to drift handling model that works perfectly fine for this kind of game. Within the race, you now get money for all kinds of actions, you attract the cops through reckless driving, which you can engage for even more money. It's just a shame that the opponent AI is so horribly slow that no race is ever actually challenging. But that has to be my main complaint about the game, honestly. Other small complaints would be the still fairly limited amount of tracks and general game feel not being as smooth as in other DS racing games. That should cover about all in regards to Asphalt 2, although there are some minor differences worth highlighting, such as the renaming of certain tracks like Chernobyl now being called... Oh, uh... Well, that aged about as well as an unvaccinated toddler. 7 out of 10. Pleasantly surprised by the increase in quality of the Asphalt series, I wanted to once again go back to the Need for Speed franchise after the incredible drop that was most wanted. Next up would be Need for Speed Carbon on the City, which was a different take on the original Carbon available for PC and home consoles. Whereas Underground 2 and Most Wanted tried to be more close to the original games, Carbon on the City was meant to deliver a slightly different experience built on the same foundations as the original Carbon. In more concrete terms, this means that the general atmosphere and gameplay loop is maintained, but the story, map and various other small elements have been changed. On the City was also available on the PSP and is mostly the same story and content wise as the DS version we will be checking out. Whereas the original Carbon continued the storyline of Most Wanted, Carbon on the City tells a new story where you take control of a character who gets into an accident in the beginning of the game, along with your character's brother who tragically passed away in the accident. Waking up in the hospital with severe memory loss and a suspicion that you were set up, you race through the territories to question the people who control the city about what really happened that fateful night. Having played the PSP version before, I can say that I definitely like the story, and the story has been mostly maintained on the DS version with the only difference being that it is being told in text rather than voice lines. That is about the only similarity to the PSP version though, as the rest of the game is actually drastically to minimally different. Front and center of those differences is the handling model. And this might be a shocker to you, but this handling model of the DS version is actually phenomenal and I much prefer it over the PSP version. The steering feels very intuitive. There's a pretty natural feeling slide if your car goes sideways and at no point did I have the feeling I wasn't 100% sure of what my car was doing at any given moment. Of course you still only have digital inputs, but the developers came up with a clever solution to rectify this problem. If you find yourself in a position where you only want very small steering adjustments, you could press the D-pad diagonally upwards like this. That way, the car will steer ever so slightly to either direction. If you want more steering angle for sharp corners, you can press the D-pad diagonally downwards and your car will turn in much sharper. Here's the kicker though. I never actually felt like it was necessary to use this mechanic. Aside from the handling, the physics feel great as well. Jumps pull your car back down with a pretty believable gravity, collisions don't feel strange, and in general the game plays surprisingly well. Add to that an amazing sense of speed, and you got yourself one of the best playing racing games on the entire system. But what about the rest of the game? 
Well, graphically, I think it looks alright. Environments can feel a bit samey and the car models definitely look better in asphalt, but it's nothing that threw me off considering the hardware it's running on. In terms of sound, there isn't much that stood out to me other than the music, which opted in to take a small handful of songs from the original console and PC version instead of horribly produced original music. Sure, it sounds incredibly compressed, but since the music in Carbon was so good anyways, I didn't mind. Customization returns and is sadly a bit limited considering you can only put full body kits on your cars as opposed to changing each bumper individually, but therefore each body kit is unique to the car. One cool thing however is the introduction of interior customization, where you can change various elements of what's shown on your touchscreen during a race. This makes Carbon on the City on the DS the only game in the entire Need for Speed franchise with interior customization. Let that sink in for a little bit. Typically for Carbon, you have a teammate accompanying you throughout most of the races and you get to choose between a blocker and a drafter for each race. Blockers work the same way as in the original where they try to take out opponents using pit maneuvers. This has only rarely worked for me in practice, so I usually opted in for drafters who will recover your nitrous if you drive behind them because your nitrous does not refill naturally. It should be clear by now that I am struggling to find any flaws and complaints about this game and really the only thing I was frustrated by was the difficulty as I had to rely a lot on save states to make it reliably through the midsection of the game. That and a lack of different event types let repetition sink in fairly quickly, but otherwise Carbon on the City on the Nintendo DS is an amazing game that I actually ended up preferring over the PSP version. It's not even just good for a DS game, it's a good game period. And for that I am happy to make Carbon on the City the highest ranking game so far with a 9 out of 10. I don't know if my bar was really low going into this, but honestly so far these DS racing games have been kind of impressive. I mean sure I expected that some of these games are probably not gonna meet even my quality standards. But um, yeah honestly so far pretty impressive considering how low powered the hardware of the Nintendo DS was. Um, not bad so far. With such a banger it will be hard for any game to follow up. But let's have a look at Juice 2 which is yet another port. The Juice franchise has been a fairly short endeavor in the mid 2000s and tried to get in on the underground street racing hype. Only that in Juice 2 the tracks aren't actually illegal, but it still has city tracks, customization and just the right atmosphere to pass for another street racing game. I played the PC version of Juice 2 fairly recently for the first time and I quite enjoyed my time with it. I don't think it really did anything special, besides maybe figuring out how many half-naked ladies you can fit onto a screen before the game gets past as M-rated, but it didn't need to, as I was coming in just wanting to have a fun time, which the game did ultimately provide. Juice 2 hasn't really been a high budget title, none of the Juice games were for that matter, so I was actually quite surprised there even existed other versions of the game. And at first glance the DS version looks... surprisingly good? At least graphically, but believe me when I say that this is a mere distraction from the core gameplay, which is actually horrible. Oh boy, so let's cut to the chase and get into the specifics right away. The camera pans way too slowly, oftentimes making it impossible to see consecutive turns in time. It may look like the sense of speed is horrible, what you're looking at here is footage from the middle of the game actually, but it's not the sense of speed that's problematic, and rather the actual speed of the cars. Are you really trying to tell me that an M3 can't even reach 200 km per hour? And yes, those are indeed kilometers per hour. In general you reach top speed pretty much instantly, cars have very little to no problem reaching it, making the driving feel extremely simplistic. The shallow driving model doesn't help in this instance either. Overall the driving is fairly below average even for a DS racing game, which gets even more obvious when looking back at footage from Carbon and its phenomenal driving feel. So the racing doesn't really impress. What about the rest? Well for one, it follows the general progression system of the original game where you need to perform certain actions in order to unlock more events. Some like it, some don't. Personally I would have preferred a more straightforward progression with these goals being optional things to do for more money, parts and maybe even cars. One amazing feature that sadly didn't make a return is pink slip races. In both Juice 1 and 2 you can challenge any racer you like to a duel and the winner gets the loser's vehicle. And yes, this also applies to you. And the coolest thing about these events is that if you lose one of your cars to someone, that particular someone will proceed to use your car in races. 
<laughs> Kaiko is actually driving him with my old vet. <laughs> <laughs> she still has my my Corvette thing right from earlier. And if you get lucky enough, you can challenge them to a second duel and get your car back. We're getting back our Corvette. Let's go. <laughs> I really like that that you can get your car back like this. Getting that sweet revenge is so nice. It's literally the main plot from Need for Speed Most Wanted, except it is integrated into the gameplay as a core mechanic, and it is using your own cars that you have built up. It is this very feature that made both juiced games so beloved, so seeing it completely absent here is extremely disappointing, and I don't think the hardware would have been an issue. Beyond this major omission, customization is possible on the DS version, However, I am hard pressed to tell you much about it because it is not only extremely expensive, but also completely pointless. Let me quickly outline the gameplay loop of this game. You start a league with a selection of vehicles, all of which you own and didn't need to buy, with one of them usually outpacing the others in terms of stats, making 80% of the cars in this game completely useless. After selecting the fastest car out of the bunch, you start clearing some goals of the league you are currently on. Once you complete enough goals, which usually takes around 15 minutes, you unlock the next league, which simultaneously unlocks a new set of vehicles. Those vehicles are a lot faster than what you have previously used, and since you get to use whatever car you want for free, there is no point in sticking with your current vehicle. And this is exactly why customizing and upgrading any car is pointless. Why spend anything on a vehicle that you know is going to be obsolete after a mere 5 races? Especially when a full customization is pretty much unaffordable. Look at this, I was trying to give my 350Z here a full makeover and it cost me pretty much my entire balance. Now this wouldn't be unusual if this wasn't halfway through the career and I hadn't actually spent a single cent on anything yet. I hope I made it clear that from a purely game design standpoint, this game is a dumpster fire. And normally this would be it. But we still have to talk about what is probably the worst handling I have ever experienced in a racing game. But Dustin, you might ask, didn't you just say earlier that the handling is simplistic? How bad could it be? Well, dear viewer, that was referring to the handling in regular circuit races. But the game also comes with a drift mode, which has its own kind of handling model. And I don't think there are enough words in the dictionary to describe how random and haphazardly this handling model feels. So here are a handful of synonyms for the word uncontrollable to hopefully convey my feelings towards this driving model. The best way I can describe what makes it so bad is by just showing it. First off, the cars don't actually go sideways which makes it really hard to tell when you are actually drifting or not. Secondly, your cars seem to follow some kind of rail along the road in order to guide you along the track. This assist is so strong that it tends to completely throw your car around in an instant. And if that isn't enough, some tracks are so horribly designed around this handling model that getting any decent points on them is a complete crapshoot. By the way, points are mostly accumulated by the length of your drift. Angle, speed, transitions, all of that doesn't even matter. So when you get presented with a track where it is literally impossible to do long drifts, you will inevitably hit a brick wall. Seriously, I got stuck on this event here where I had to miraculously create 70,000 points and the most I could muster after a lot of retries and practice was half of that. I am convinced that no one has actually gotten past this point in the game. It is literally impossible in my mind. But let's wrap up this long winded rant on the DS port of Juice 2 all in all, it is one of the worst games in the video, however not quite on the same nuclear level as most wanted, so I will still give it a 3 out of 10. But honestly, imagine how cool pink slip races in this would have been. I mean, in hindsight, I guess with the general gameplay, I'm not sure how fun it really would have been, but I think it really could have elevated this game to like a way higher level and actually turn it into a pretty okay game if they removed the drifting. That was horrible. That was a lot worse than I initially expected. Time to seek refuge with the next Need for Speed game, which has every chance to be good after Carbon being such a monumental achievement for the genre on the Nintendo DS. So next up we will be taking a look at Need for Speed Pro Street, a game that initially received a bit of controversy as it shifted away from the established street racing identity. 
Nonetheless, Pro Street ended up becoming a slow burn for many people who picked it up again years later, realizing that it still offers a great, if a bit flawed experience. Naturally, it too received a whole variety of ports, among them one for the Nintendo DS. And with Carbon's great showing, can this one match the bar? Oh yes. Yes, it absolutely can. In fact, it smashes it. Pro Street on the DS seems to build on the groundwork that Carbon established, but refines it a lot more. As such, the handling, which is still great, has a lot more depth to it, like a pretty believable loss of control and a satisfying resulting drift. Or the fact that you can really feel distinct differences between drivetrain types. It's hard for me to explain what makes the handling model so good, but the lack of input delay and very believable and natural feeling physics are an absolute joy. Add to that a once again great sense of speed and you get what might even be a better driving experience than the console version. Unlike Carbon, you will be driving on closed tracks this time, some of them being fictional and others being creative recreations of real life tracks. Make no mistake, it's still no eye candy, but it's no eye cancer either, so in general I was okay with the way the game looked. Sound quality also seemed to be roughly on the same level and I am very glad they decided to stick with compressing the licensed soundtrack again because it was an absolute banger in Pro Street. In general it's nice to see how faithful this port tried to be to the original and in one aspect it even managed to exceed it. In the original version you can damage your car and the damage is ranked into cosmetic damage, light damage and heavy damage depending on the severity of hits your car took. Damage needed to be repaired with your own money, however it only had a very minor effect on the performance of the car. Even with insane damage to the car, the performance loss was hard to notice and the handling of the car would only marginally get more difficult. Now imagine my absolute shock when the DS port not just adopted all of that, but made it even more detailed. Although the cars don't have any visual damage, the mechanical damage is actually calculated in percentages as opposed to just three states. The area of impact also matters now as certain parts of the car can get more damage than others. And most importantly, you can actually feel a difference. While at 10% damage the car still mostly operates as normal, at 70% you can feel a noticeable lack of top speeds and your car can steer slightly into one direction. This is definitely something I did not expect coming into this and this more detailed damage model is one of my favorite things about the game. But that's not even all. If you remember one of my minor complaints about Carbon, it's that the game didn't really offer any distinct event types that felt different enough to shake up the repetition. Pro Street rectifies that entirely by actually managing to include every single event type of the original game. Thus you now have a proper drag racing mode along with the iconic warming up your tires part, and also a drift mode with a handling model that doesn't suck. And once again, it actually manages to improve on the original in this aspect. In the original release, you need to perform three sets of drag and drift races per event. This got somewhat repetitive and unneeded after some time, and the DS port solves this very cleverly by simply asking you to perform once. Of course we can't forget about the speed events, which are essentially regular circuit races, except they take place on very fast and dangerous sprint tracks. And yes, Nevada is just as scary as in the original. All this is presented in a career mode that is pretty much identical to the original game as well. What isn't identical sadly, but also understandably, is the customization, which is sadly a bit more limited than even in Carbon on the DS through the exclusion of hoods and a few other things. But that downside comes with one massive upside, and it's that certain customization actually affects your performance. In the real world, putting a decent spoiler on a car would increase its downforce, which has been recreated in this port by most spoilers giving you an increase to your handling stat at the cost of some top speed. However, there are also a few drag spoilers that actually increase your top speed if you can afford some loss in handling. This is really cool and was honestly not even necessary, so I am glad this is a thing. It seems like everything is perfect in this game, doesn't it? Well, there's one elephant in the room I have to address. It seems like the creators of the DS port looked at Underground 2's annoying minigames and thought to themselves, hey, let's do one of these two for no reason and ruin what could be a flawless game. As a result, you will be competing in a game mode called Hydraulics, which at its core is a simple rhythm minigame. 
But hey, Pro Street had great music and rhythm games aren't typically that bad. So what could possibly go wrong? The answer is everything. If it isn't obvious already, the screen is completely littered with visual effects that aren't just insanely distracting, but I could swear, completely cover the button prompts occasionally. This gets even worse when they decide to rotate the entire UI and you can't rely on your peripheral vision anymore to see what buttons are coming up. However, this is absolutely nothing to the worst thing, the absolute worst offender you can do to any rhythm game ever. The button prompts are completely offbeat and are not in sync with the music whatsoever. I hope it is understandable that all this makes this game mode completely unplayable. And usually I would not even be so hard on it if it was a simple bonus mode you can unlock outside of the career. But no, this is an integral part of the career and while you can finish the game without ever doing a single one of these, that gets thrown out the window if you want to 100% complete the game. Something I would have loved to do if it wasn't for this garbage. Nonetheless, I will still give this game a stellar rating of 10 out of 10. Even with this horrible minigame, Pro Street on the DS is probably the best racing game on the entire system if you are looking for something that isn't Mario Kart. What a fantastic game. Man, Pro Street is such a gem. Uh, both Carbon and Pro Street for that matter. I really didn't expect games to be that good. Like, I don't know what they did with the handling, but it just works. It just feels super intuitive. So, yeah, absolute win all around. With such a marvelous piece of software, it will be very difficult for any game to follow up on it. So let's just all reset our expectations to those of the beginning of the video. The next game in line I checked out was Race Driver Grid. Yet another port of a very beloved and successful racing game. The original Grid was a stellar game released in 2008 with its main appeals being a very expensive career mode where you can manage your own team, but also a very impressive variety of event types that kept the game fresh through its roughly 20 hour runtime. To this day, it remains the best entry in the franchise by a country mile, and once again I was taken by surprise to find out it received a DS port. Now how can you fit such an intricate career mode and add a whole plethora of different event types into one small DS cartridge? I don't know why I asked that question because I can't answer it, but somehow it is possible to even double down on it with a whole entire track creator. But let's not get ahead of ourselves here and look at the moment to moment gameplay first. I don't think I will make any enemies here by saying that at first glance this game is very ugly. The car models, in particular the liveries, look extremely muddy and distorted. The tracks look really blocky and lack any kind of detail. And the sound, once again, sounds like my speakers are malfunctioning. But I promise you that all of this is a compromise for the sheer amount of content the game offers, which we will be getting into in a bit. First off though, the handling is fine. It's not great, but it's controllable enough to take decent racing lines and understand at what point your car will begin to slide. The slides themselves feel a bit tacked on sometimes, but all in all I had little problems navigating my cars around the tracks. Now with all that out of the way, let's talk about the actual meat of the game, that being its content offering. I was astonished to see that pretty much every event type has been preserved in the DS port, along with all of the variety of tracks, locations and car types. So just like in the original game, you can hop into touring cars on real life tracks, or blaze through a city track in some chunky muscle cars, drift through the docks of Yokohama, or deliver some tofu on Japan's mountain passes. There may be a few omissions I might be missing here, but the fact that they managed to create all of these different types of racing and make them all feel alright, is insane considering other games couldn't even nail one single thing. Sadly, the career has been watered down a bit, so you won't be managing your own team the same way you are familiar with in the original game. But that can be forgiven for the inclusion of what might be the most mind-blowing thing I have ever seen even be possible on a Nintendo DS. Track creation. And we're not talking about editing existing tracks. No, I mean actual, complete, fully controllable track creation. You put down the start finish line somewhere and then you are freely able to create whatever track you desire using a variety of straights, turns, chicanes 
and cosmetic objects you can put down wherever you please. If that's too complicated for you, you can simply draw the track design using the touchscreen. Once you have placed on everything you need, you can set up a number of different parameters for your track, such as the lighting or weather. In my case, I set all the lighting of my track to red and gave it the name Hell. And this is what it looked like. This is my track that I created on my own and there is no other one like it. It's absolutely horrible and an eyesore, but it's mine and I love it. This very feature has to be my favorite part of the whole game, so I was pleased to see they found a very interesting way to integrate it into the career. Occasionally you will run into so-called blueprint events where you will be given the opportunity to build a track. However, you get certain objectives telling you what the track needs to have included. A certain amount of straights, a minimum distance, using very specific types of building blocks. A lot needs to be squeezed in on a track that is already littered with rocks and other obstacles that can't be moved. So you will need to do a fair amount of planning out and strategizing if you want to complete the event. It's funny how the one aspect of the game in which you aren't actually racing became my most favorite. These sorts of puzzles were right up my alley and I enjoyed them a lot. Although it is a shame that you won't be able to drive on the track you have created afterwards. Now the question is, was it worth trading the intricate career mode of the original for this track creator? I think the answer will be different depending on who you ask, but personally I enjoyed that the DS port went for something different instead. It is definitely true that the career is pretty much a go here do this type of deal, but considering most people play DS games in short bursts, it's hardly worth criticizing since the actual variety of events more than makes up for it. All in all, Race Driver Grid was a very surprising game, however I would still prefer both Need for Speed Carbon and Pro Street over this one because of the much superior driving model, car customization and graphics that don't make me want to gauge my eyes out. Still, a more than decent game, very deserving of a 7 out of 10. Race Driver Grid wasn't Codemasters only smash hit though, as around the same time they released one of the most fun rally games ever made, Dirt 2. This will be an interesting one as Dirt 2 is the only off-road racing game in the collection. During my research I found a few more, but I decided to stick with this one as Dirt 2 is pretty much my favorite rally game and just like with Grid I was surprised to see it received a DS port. At first glance it's obvious they copied over a bunch of assets from Grid, most prominently the menus. Not that it's a bad thing, if anything it means the developers could focus more on the actual gameplay than anything else. Well, so how is the gameplay? It's pretty good. I was a bit concerned about how well you could make a physics model for uneven surfaces in a game that's all about that kind of stuff, when most DS games stumble even doing simple physics for tarmac. Thankfully they managed to nail it pretty well here. Sure, it's nowhere near as detailed and believable as in the original game, but certainly good enough to make me understand how these cars behave. The sliding in particular is important to get right, as that's what you'll mainly be doing, and I'm glad to say the sliding feels decent. At times the cars almost felt a bit too grippy and easy to control, but considering it's a DS racing game, I assume the developers wanted to keep it simple. One of Dirt 2's biggest strengths, at least in the original, were the amazing tracks and their variety, and I'm glad this has mostly been retained in this version of the game. Some are more interesting than others for sure, but at their best they can easily compete with the original game in terms of track design and interesting visuals. Sure, graphically it doesn't really impress anyone, however considering it's supposed to be a step up from grit, the graphical improvement is definitely pleasant to see. One thing that irked me a bit was the limited vehicle selection and that you could almost take any car anywhere. The original Dirt 2 lived and breathed through its different types of vehicles ranging from classic rally cars to big trucks, over buggies and some insane fast trailblazer cars. In the DS port you get a small handful of half of these vehicle types and you're free to choose whichever you want for the most part. This makes most races feel fairly samey unless you deliberately choose to drive different cars all the time, which isn't always easy as you now have a bank balance to take care of. Although it may sound like I'm complaining, I'm glad they ditched Grid's simplistic approach to your garage and now let you buy, upgrade and customize cars to your liking. None of it is ever super impressive. For example, you only get to choose between three different liveries per car, but you can make a simple one yourself if you choose. It's not much, but this kind of stuff really helps to make any racing game more fun, even in its simplest form. The feeling of progression is an important aspect to any racing game, 
and it's probably for this reason, as well as the better handling and graphics, that I prefer this over Grid. But what about the track creator? Wasn't that something I loved about Grid? Yep, and it's still here. It's just tucked away in its own menu outside of the career, which makes sense considering Dirt 2 always was more casual. So you won't have to be designing blueprints with restrictions and objectives anymore, but you can still create tracks using mostly the same building blocks, only this time it's mainly on dirt surfaces. However, you can choose different environments and weather this time, so of course I created a track in the desert where it is snowing. You may find this site strange now, but this is what our world will look like in the distant future. So all in all, I quite enjoyed Dirt 2, just as much if not a little more than Grid, However, I will still be ranking them both on the same level, although I would definitely choose Dirt 2 over Grid. Both of them are more than decent games all around and definitely worth picking up if you want to try out some DS racing games yourself. I think it's time we jump back into the Need for Speed franchise. With Pro Street still standing as the best racing game so far, one can only wonder where they decided to take it from here. Unfortunately, the game that came afterwards was Undercover. Released in 2008 predominantly for 7th generation consoles, Need for Speed Undercover marked the first truly underperforming game in the franchise. Aside from a general lack of polish, it failed to truly push the franchise forwards and felt like a worse version of Most Wanted in multiple ways at the time. Over time however, Undercover managed to accumulate a cult following and is enjoyed by fans despite its flaws. It is pretty obvious that Undercover was simply underdeveloped and rushed which obviously paints a horrible picture for the DS version. If they couldn't even properly finish the main version, how in the world does the DS port look like? Honestly, I expected much worse. Need for Speed Undercover on the DS follows roughly the same story beats as in the original, albeit scaled down and summarized so much to the point where it's even hard to understand what you are doing and why. The game starts with Chase Lin just straight up telling you about some criminal activity that you are supposed to take part in to get accustomed to the scene. No explanation who we are, no explanation who Chase is, no explanation about why we are actually doing anything. If you only played the DS version, you might as well believe that you aren't actually an undercover cop, which is hilarious considering that word is literally on the box. The story as usual gets told through still images and text and is fine for the most part. The pacing is just a lot faster and as soon as characters get introduced, you are supposed to take them out right away. It's a bit jarring, but it's not like the story of Undercover was ever a strong suit of the original. So let's talk about the gameplay, which also wasn't a strong suit of the original. One of Pro Street DS's strongest points was its handling. So I was initially pretty upset to see that it got simplified a lot in this one. It's pretty obvious they made this game from scratch without maintaining much from Pro Street, which I think is a shame. The handling is still alright. Cars react pretty quickly and have a decent amount of grip, but the depth is simply missing. It is almost impossible to get your car into a slide, no matter how much you yank the e-brake. Thankfully, this gets partially elevated through a yet again great sense of speed. Honestly, maybe the best sense of speed I've seen yet. Although that's only partially true, as it's not really the sense of speed that's high, and more so the actual speed. But it still works pretty well, especially once you get into cars that can reach 300 km per hour. What doesn't work well is the AI, and I am genuinely not exaggerating when I say that this game has the worst rubber band mechanic I have ever seen in my over 17 years of playing racing games. Visually, the game won't win anyone over, I think. Although I am glad they decided to not include the nuclear yellow filter from the original. The best I can describe the visuals is by saying it looks blocky. The buildings have little to no detail on them, the roads aren't even really curved properly, everything simply has very visible edges. In general the tracks aren't really anything to write home about and feel all too similar because the entire game takes place on an... Wait a minute. Is that an open world? An actual map you can freely drive around in? No closed tracks, but an interconnected city with designated areas? And you can do pursuits on them like in the original games? How do these DS games find ways to impress me? So yes, the reason why everything looks so simplistic is because the developers actually opted in for trying to create an open world on the DS. Out of all the games I have and will continue to showcase in this video, 
Undercover remains the only game even remotely having an open world. Throughout the career, you won't really get to interact with it all that much, but you do occasionally get thrown into designated pursuit events where you either need to escape from the cops and find your way to a hideout, create a certain amount of damages, or actually get into a cop car and arrest some racers. All of this is standard affair for a decent Need for Speed game, but to see this on a handheld, the Nintendo DS no less, is truly wild. And as much as I loved Carbon, I have to give this game props for actually attempting to mirror its original in the closest way possible. That being said, most of the events in the open world are nothing to write home about, as the open world lacks any form of detail. For example, pursuit breakers and hideouts are completely absent. Cost of state events usually end up looking like this, more than anything else, thanks to the dodgy collision physics. I don't think I'm going to surprise anyone by saying that most of the open world objectives get pretty boring very fast, but it's still cool to see these gameplay elements realized on this hardware. That being said, as impressive as all this is, I much prefer these DS ports acknowledging they are on inferior hardware and instead trying to slim down certain content in order to make the actual core gameplay better. Sure, Carbon on the City didn't have an open world, nor did it have cops, but I believe it was a better game for it. Nonetheless, I don't think Undercover on the DS is a bad game, but it also isn't this hidden gem of an entry that marked the first truly controversial point in the franchise. This rubber banding though... <sighs> 6 out of 10. Do you remember my remark on collision physics when I was talking about Undercover? I don't think I talked about this specifically yet, but racing games on the DS tend to have some really strange collision physics. The only game that had a truly understandable and believable physics model was Pro Street in my opinion. I truly believe that it has to be the fault of the hardware, after all collision physics weren't always great in numerous PlayStation 1 titles. Sure, with enough time and expertise you can get it to work well as Pro Street has shown, but the previous games in the video made it obvious to me that this will probably be a reoccurring problem with any game moving forward. Now what happens if you then take a game that is all about collisions and crashes and try to port it on the DS, a system which we have just established to have issues in that regard. The answer is... Burnout Legends. Well, it seems like we finally hit rock bottom. I don't think footage has ever spoken more for itself than now. If you have ever played any Burnout game from any era, you are probably in tears right now just looking at this. But don't you worry, we are going to dissect this game regardless in case you aren't yet. But before we do, let's get the positives out of the way first. I must honestly say that graphically, this is probably the most impressive looking game yet. Textures aren't muddy and in general the game has a much more natural look to it. That is until you hit the boost button and the game shows what I deem to be the worst motion blur effect I have ever seen. I mean, look at this. It makes the game look slower. How do you even manage that? Ah dang, ah, caught myself complaining there. We still want to get the positives out of the way first. So moving on, we actually have a fully functioning visual damage model in this one. If you hit opponents or the walls, your car will start getting damaged, which is best seen when you actually crash out. It's definitely not super advanced, but it's still nice to see this port trying to adapt something that has always been a staple of the Burnout franchise. Moving on to the next positive. Oh. That's it already. Oh. Well then, let the roasting begin. This handling sucks. I mean, it really sucks. Every Burnout game has a pretty easy to learn break to drift handling model, which is always very intuitive. I have played this port for well over an hour and I still do not understand how to engage a drift. Tapping the brake does nothing. Tapping the e-brake does nothing. Tapping the gas also does nothing. The most reliable way to initiate a drift I have found is to let go of the gas, tap the brake while steering into the opposite direction you want to turn in, let go of the brake and while re-engaging the throttle, steer into the actual direction you want to turn into. Does this sound like an intuitive handling model to you? And that's only semi-reliable, as even this wouldn't work sometimes. But when you actually manage to get into a drift, your car isn't even actually drifting, but is simply getting 3 to 4 times the grip it usually has. The kicker, once you are drifting, you can use that extra grip endlessly as long as you are steering, 
basically meaning you can swerve from side to side with no issues. And when you aren't drifting, the handling feels so unpolished as there is basically no transition in your turning radius. You just move from side to side at the same speed, no matter how long you press the steering. <sighs> but that's only the handling, folks. We haven't even talked about the collision physics yet. The main thing I used to introduce this game. I think in this instance, I will simply let the footage speak for itself. I'm not sure if I should even start talking about the content offering in this game when the general experience is already so poor, so I will simply brush over it. Final Legends is supposed to be some sort of best of game of the first three entries in the franchise. So besides regular time trialing, you have both Road Rage and Pursuit events. None of these are fun because of the aforementioned collision physics. But beyond that, they actually managed to add in the renowned crash mode, where you have to throw your car into a busy junction to cause the most amount of damage. I knew going into it that it wouldn't be the explosive and chaotic experience I'm familiar with from the original games. But I don't think anything could have prepared me for how sad this mode truly is. Early on in the video I said I'd try not to compare these DS ports to their original counterparts, but for this instance I have to make an exception to truly show how pathetic this mode is. Honestly, that's about all I have to say about Burnout Legends. The admittedly decent graphics can't really undo the horrible experience with this game. In fact, the graphics are the only thing that's keeping me from putting this on the same level as Most Wanted. And for that, Burnout Legends is getting a 2 out of 10 for me. This is easily the worst Burnout game in the entire franchise and you should never ever play this game. Oh man. You know, for, for a moment I was actually really excited for a Burnout game on the go. But I think the PSP version of Legends is just way better, so that's probably what you want to go for. This is honestly horrible. With two massive stinkers out of the way, surely it can't get any worse, right? Ah, life always finds new ways to highlight my naivety. Ford Racing 3 for the Nintendo DS is once again another port of the original Ford Racing 3, which was a budget title that was released back during the 6th console generation. It always had a fairly niche but dedicated fanbase of Ford lovers as the Ford Racing series only featured Ford vehicles as the title suggests. And although I am a massive racing game nerd, the Ford Racing series actually went past me entirely and is still on my backlog. This puts the DS port in the unfortunate position of being my very first exposure to the franchise. As such, I may not draw as many comparisons to the original game and will instead view this port as its entirely own thing. So what we have here is essentially a fairly box standard racing game on closed city tracks. The main career puts you into several championships starting in classic forts and later on leads into more modern and faster models as you progress. I, however, did not progress very far into this game for one very simple reason. This might be the most boring game in the entire collection. But why is that? What makes this affair so much more boring than even the worst games we've seen so far? I believe all of this comes down to the driving itself. The cars are very stiff and behave very predictably. Even the faster ones have very low turn radii, apparently that's the plural for radius, and in general a decent sense of speed never really comes up. This makes the slow, classic Fords an absolute chore to drive, now coupled with pretty long race lengths, boring looking tracks and a general feeling of emptiness within the races, and you will find yourself bored even on short play sessions. Sure, games like Most Wanted or Burnout Legends on the DS felt worse to play, but at least those games didn't make me feel like I accidentally took sleeping medication. But thankfully, there's a separate career mode outside of the career that includes various challenges which are all much shorter and put you into different cars a lot quicker. This did help fight my feeling of boredom a little bit, but even in cars like a Ford GT, the racing never really becomes exciting. And honestly, that's about all there is to say about Ford Racing 3. I think my biggest praise for the game would be an interesting selection of vehicles, but even that gets thrown out the window with pretty bad looking car models. I mean, look closely at the wheels on this one. Not only is the fitment completely wrong, but the wheels aren't even rotating correctly. 
Port Racing 3 is exactly what I expect a budget title on the DS to be like. Bland, uninteresting, and generally not worth playing. On paper, Burnout Legends might be worse, but Fort Racing 3 fails at the very thing a game is supposed to do. Be fun. At least the developers were mindful enough to put the rating they went for right on the logo. A 3. Well, I sure hope that the mainline Fort Racing games aren't gonna be as bad as this one, because as I said, I still have to check them out. And I really hope that this was just an outlier, because this has honestly kind of soured my first experience. It seems that we've hit a bit of a low with these games. So what better way to continue with one of the most disliked games in the Need for Speed franchise? Need for Speed Nitro was a spin-off title for the Nintendo Wii and DS and released one year after Undercover. Due to its more arcadey and child-friendly aesthetics, it went past most people as the black sheep of the franchise. And while it certainly carries few of the qualities of the series, I always had a soft spot for Nitro when I played it on my Wii many years ago. I actually quite enjoyed the game and its progression, its tracks and the soundtrack. Although these might be nostalgia clouded memories as I haven't played the game in over 10 years, so what better way to revisit it using the DS version? At first glance it seems to be fairly close to the counterpart on the Nintendo Wii. The presentation and atmospheres mostly preserved all or at least most of the locations made into the game and in general this is Nitro how I remember it. After a short tutorial you are free to go wherever you like. In my case I started in San Diego and once we actually got into the game am I driving on a roller coaster? Oh my god what is going on? So it seems as if Nitro on the DS went even harder on the over-the-top nonsensical concepts of the game. A good decision in my opinion. If you are going to make a spin-off title, you might as well go all out with it. Thus, the game actually has really interesting tracks with plenty of different areas and lots of opportunities for ridiculous stunts. All this gets served with a pretty good sense of speed and a working handling model, and what you get is a surprisingly enjoyable game. The only time I wasn't really enjoying myself was during these weird smash-up events, where you are basically just driving around and destroying objects randomly placed in a small area. I think these work exactly against the design principles that the game was built on, and I skipped them whenever I could. Sticking to the races made the experience much better, however there are some qualms I have with those as well. The main one being the downright insulting rubber band. It is practically impossible to shake any opponent no matter how perfectly you drive. They will not just stick to your tail, but also frequently pass you all the time. Thankfully, you can perform a literal backflip over their car if you are close enough by performing a quick time event. I just realized how incredibly stupid that sounds. But it doesn't help the feeling that every race feels incredibly rigged against you. My other main issue with the game is that it is very simplistic. It is very much a what you see is what you get kind of deal. You can technically customize the cars, but it has to be the most simplistic customization I have seen yet, with only a small selection of preset colors and vinyls being selectable. Progression is also as simple as it gets. Just win some races and you will eventually unlock more races and cars that are pretty much handed to you. You don't really have any choice in anything except for which event to do next. And to be fair, that may be a bit much to expect for a game of this caliber. But I do remember the Wii version giving you more options than this. I also remember the Wii version having characters to go up against, which are completely absent from the DS version. All in all, Need for Speed Nitro DS is certainly an inferior version to the original. Although that's true for almost all of the ports we have seen here. However, unlike the really good ones that add something unique, or improve on at least select aspects of the original game, Nitro on the DS is just generally inferior. That being said, Nitro isn't a bad DS racing game on its own merit, but also nothing that will blow anyone's mind. It is slightly above what I'd expect to be average for the system thanks to its really cool tracks and soundtrack. Seriously, this soundtrack is an absolute banger. And as such, I will give it a modest 6 out of 10. This also marks the final Need for Speed game on the DS, and what a trip it was. We saw some genuinely terrible entries and some truly remarkable ones. Carbon and Pro Street both really impressed me and are absolutely worth finishing. Even the first port with Underground 2 wasn't bad either. And how Undercover managed to cram an open world with functioning cop AI into the cartridge is still a miracle to me. 
But on the other hand, we had the DS version of Most Wanted, which might actually go down as the single worst Need for Speed game amongst all the different ports and releases that have ever existed. I mean, think about it. Both Undercover and Nitro are much, much better games on the DS than the one and only Most Wanted. What a ride. With Need for Speed having wrapped up, we are not done still as we have two more games left to go. Next up, I wanted to check out one of the two Trackmania games that were released on the system, and I decided to go with Trackmania Turbo. Before we start, we have to clear something up that I'm sure some Trackmania experts are already raising an eyebrow over. Yes, the title we will be checking out is called Trackmania Turbo. This one is not to be confused with the actual Trackmania Turbo that was released in 2016. That is an entirely different game and Trackmania Turbo on the DS has nothing to do with that one. The DS version is not a port of any title, but is based on Trackmania United from what I can tell. The way I see it, when they made Trackmania Turbo in 2016, they simply forgot that a Trackmania game with that very same name already existed on the Nintendo DS. So no, this game was not released in 2016, but in 2010 instead. So with that out of the way, what is Trackmania Turbo on the DS like? To my surprise, it is shockingly close to the actual experience on the PC. Let it be known that I am far from an expert on the series and people that have played these games for years will probably be able to recognize all the subtle differences in physics and whatnot. To a filthy casual like me though, the looks, handling and physics felt extremely familiar and it didn't take long for me to get used to it at all as I was already used to it and simply needed a quick refresher. The main difference that I have noticed is the inclusion of air steering, so you can basically rotate your car in mid-air on this one. It's almost like they found a way to cram the original engine along with all its physics into this DS port, which in of itself is pretty impressive. So yes, this is Trackmania just like you know it, even featuring more than just Stadium as a discipline. Sadly, all this comes at a price. This game's performance is absolutely unacceptable. <sighs> so I got something to add here. In the original draft of the video, I would now go on a two minute long rant on the performance of this DS game and how it absolutely ruined my experience. Based on a few short clips that I have recorded, you can already tell that it was pretty bad. Like the game would constantly dip into the sub 10 FPS. And I would talk about how that absolutely ruins what would otherwise be a super impressive game. It was absolutely unplayable, yada yada yada. And at the end of the day, I would give the game a 4 out of 10. Now, while doing a little bit more research on the game and looking at its Wikipedia page, it said that most of the reviewers back, at the, back in the day actually really praised this game for its frame rates and performance. And it just got me like... Did we play the same game? And so I actually tried to play the game again and yes, the performance was still bad even if I cranked all the settings down. And so I was like, are the reviewers actually wrong or is the emulator actually just bad? And yeah, so I tried playing the game on a different emulator and lo and behold, the game actually ran much better. So what does that all mean for this short little review section? At the end of the day, the performance of the game is much better than I had initially experienced. That means that Trackmania Turbo on the DS is an extremely impressive game that really attempts to mirror the original as close as possible. And yeah, it does probably make it one of the best Nintendo DS racing games out there. It has the physics, it has the handling, it has different types of modes. Hell, it even has the track creator. One thing that I'm sure it didn't really have is the multiplayer, and I think that's kind of like the main thing about Trackmania, at least for me personally, is that there are so many servers out there with so many community-made tracks that you can play online with so many people. Like that to me has always made up the main appeal of Trackmania. And I highly doubt that the DS version managed to even, rep even remotely replicate that. And so with the main appeal kind of gone, it just kind of leaves this DS port in a really awkward spot where 
It is really good, but it's missing the main component of a Trackmania game. So how do we end this entire mess? I think at the end of the day, the game gets an 8 out of 10 for me. It's, it's a really impressive piece of software, all things considered. And even if it doesn't have the multiplayer functions of like other Trackmania games on the PC, it's still a really fun game and definitely one of the best ones that we've actually discussed in this video. But yeah, that wraps up this short intermission here. I'm sorry that this wasn't as smooth as the other parts. But now we're actually getting into the final game of the video. If you watched this far, thank you so much for watching. And uh, yeah, enjoy the ending. And so with that, we have finally reached the final game in this video. A game that I am sure all of you have been patiently waiting for the moment you saw it on screen. A game that can only be so abhorrently bad and ridiculous that it has to be making the bottom of the list. I am of course talking about Pimp My Ride Street Racing. Well, is it the train wreck I'm sure we all saw coming? Let's have a look. Whoa. It's actually decent? Did this game turn out to be a hidden gem after all? Time to find out. So in case you are not familiar with the Pit My Ride franchise, it actually originated from an old MTV show from the mid-2000s that had now forgotten rapper Exhibit take the rusty, crappy cars of lucky participants to a tuning shop called West Coast Customs to turn these cars into shiny, crappy cars and eventually return them back to their owners. Not going to lie, I really enjoyed the show as a kid and I always wanted to know what crazy stuff they would add to the cars next. The show has received a small handful of games, the first one just being called Pimp My Ride for the PlayStation 2. This one has gotten a decent bit of notoriety amongst the racing game community for how utterly ridiculous and bad it is. The way it does it in the show. What's going down? <laughs> Marcia, I'm here to pimp your ride, homegirl. So upon learning that a DS game about the Pimp My Ride series exists, I braced for the worst. As it turns out, however, my severe caution was pretty unneeded as I started to realize that the game in front of my eyes is a pretty decent arcade racing game. You start your career in a shitbox of your choice and a handful of customization options right from the start. You technically never need to buy anything, instead you earn Skrilla, which you can view as some sort of score that, once certain thresholds are hit, unlock new cars and customization options. Usually this is something I would criticize for being too simplistic, however you always unlock something new and not just the next race, and the customization is actually interesting. Seriously, these bumper options transform the cars into completely different looking ones. I am a bit upset that there aren't any truly ridiculous options like in the show or hell, even the PlayStation 2 game. But in general, I actually prefer this approach to unlocking things, as I can switch cars at any time I like and customize them however I want, with the only restriction being that I have to play more. I feel like this game can get away with this simplicity because it's more in the spirit of the show and customizing cars is actually fun due to the parts being unique for each one. But of course racing games aren't just about the customization. So what about the racing? I think in terms of gameplay it is pretty similar to Asphalt 2 which we have talked about in the beginning of the video. A pretty standard but okay break to drift handling and acceptable sense of speed. Skrilla and Nitrous are distributed on the track for you to collect. However, the nitrous isn't stored anywhere and will instead be used instantly the moment you collect it. A pretty strange way to handle a nitrous system if you ask me. Especially when the nitrous is placed right in front of a corner more often than not. Jumps can feel a bit awkward and scripted sometimes, but in general the racing aspect is good enough to not get in the way of unlocking more cars and customization options. One thing that actually really impressed me when first playing this game is something that you have been looking at this entire time. The graphics, more specifically the way the tracks look, are honestly really impressive. Usually these DS games tend to look more like PlayStation 1 games, sometimes in the middle between PS1 and PS2, but this one could genuinely pass as an early PlayStation 2 racing game. Sure, on an original DS the entire image will look a lot more pixelated and you won't really be able to make out as much from the graphical fidelity, which makes it even more puzzling why these tracks are oozing with detail. Although the textures themselves aren't really super high res, there is a very clear amount of care and attention put into each of these tracks, making some of the most interesting and impressive looking tracks on the entire handheld. It just blows my mind how none of the Need for Speed games which had EA 
one of the largest and wealthiest gaming publishers backing them, didn't have anywhere near the graphics that this game has. I expected Pip My Ride Street Racing to be many things, but eye candy surely was not one of them. To be fair, these cars are anything but eye candy and look pretty horrendous, but I'd argue even that is part of the Pimp My Ride experience. So all in all, Pimp My Ride Street Racing for the Nintendo DS has probably been the most pleasant surprise of them all, with it actually being a shockingly fun racing game. I am struggling whether I should give this game a 6 along with Undercover, or if it deserves a 7 along with Asphalt 2 which I compared the game to earlier. I think in general Asphalt 2 is still a better game and definitely my pick between the two, but Pin My Ride Street Racing is certainly closer to it quality wise than it is to Undercover, so I will be giving it a 7 as well. What a way to finish off this collection. <sighs> wow. That was a journey. You know, it's quite surprising what developers actually managed to squeeze out of this little system. Like, this thing is really not that powerful, like, even by standards back then. So it's really cool to see that there were actually a few games in there that were really enjoyable, but I also feel like for every game that was really good, there was also one game that was just absolutely abhorrently bad. So, how do we wrap this whole thing up? In the beginning of the video, I brought up the question why the DS had such a small representation of racing games and wondered if playing a handful of them could answer my question. Now, having spent well around two dozen hours playing 15 different racing games, I'm not sure if I can answer that question. I think the reason lies with what people wanted out of their Nintendo DS, which is hard to quantify. But it's safe to say that many kids back then wanted a DS because they wanted to play very specific games. Pokemon, Mario Bros, Sonic, whatever it may be. But the handheld had a massive arsenal of amazing games that drew in the attention of everyone. Just looking at my ranking here, the quality of racing games was all over the place. And the best ones were simply ports of games that are either better or just as good on their respective PC and home console counterparts. No one would ever play a Need for Speed game on the DS unless they had no other option. Or you are me who is a helpless nerd that asks questions that no one has ever cared about. And ports is exactly the word. The most popular games on the system weren't actually ports, but original releases made exclusively for the DS. Sure, we had those too, but none of these managed to be as polarizing for one reason or another. This also explains why Mario Kart DS has been the only racing game with any impressive success. It's an original and exclusive entry for the Nintendo DS that doesn't compromise on anything to deliver a gameplay experience that closely matches what you could get on a home console. There are many pieces that needed to come together for a racing game to be truly successful on the DS. And for some, many of those did come together, but at the end they were often overshadowed by their original counterparts or simply came out too late. Nonetheless, this has been a more than interesting excourse into a part of racing game history that I don't think many people are familiar with. It's been cool to see how all of these games try to adapt to the hardware and overcome the challenges that are presented through it. And I hope you have found this journey just as enjoyable as me, and maybe you'll even consider checking a few of these out yourself. And with that, I think it's time to retire this DS, for now at least. Uh, there are a lot of handhelds left that I could definitely still check out. And if this video does well, I probably will. So make sure to give the video a like if you enjoyed what we've seen today. And subscribe if I ever make a sequel to one of these videos. After all, I heard the PlayStation Portable has some really interesting titles on it. And I even played some of them, so that's probably a good next stop. But before I go, I would like to thank my lovely patrons right here for actually supporting me and making this whole video possible. Thank you guys so much. And if you want to stand here next to these people, the Patreon link is down in the description below if you're interested. You get lots of cool stuff, behind the scenes stuff. But that's it for now. Thank you guys for watching and I'll hopefully see you guys again soon. Bye bye.